What's up, everybody? Another incredible episode, Expert Trader Podcast. We have Matt Charts in the house today. Obviously, the mask trader. He's going to give us a rundown on his background in trading, a little bit of his recent success, and maybe we get to take off the mask. Matt Charts, welcome to the show. What's up, bro? Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. So off camera, we were just talking a little bit about your backstory. So I'm wondering if you can catch the folks at home up on your backstory in trading and kind of just give them a rundown on your experience with trading. Okay, I know. Cool. No problem, bro. So uh, like I was busy saying, like I was on Instagram and I was, I'm, I've was i been following you and all of the like um, role queue. I've been following all of those guys and um, like I've been blowing accounts and three years back, if I think down the line, I, I quit trading actually. Like I told myself, no, this is not for me. Um, I was very, my ego got in the way if I have to be tr truly honest with you. So then it basically just fell on my lap. Um, I went onto a trading forum and I found a guy actually trade with the institutional flow, but not like, like I said, not these SMC concepts that we know nowadays. He actually worked with the hedge funds. Uh, he had some few years on his back at Goldman Sachs. And um, he sadly passed away recently. But the main thing is we were like a group of six people. And like I said, I was the youngest there. So, I mean, the, the, they were a bunch of 50 year olds, 60 year olds. So they had a bunch of experience on them. And I was just watching these guys do flips from $1,000 to $10,000. And I was trying, I was obviously blowing accounts um, because I wasn't nearly as experienced as they were. Um, but more importantly, they didn't teach me strategies. They just taught me how to manage my risk um, each and every day. It was like I was going to school all over again. Like if I did something wrong with managing my risk, I got scolded for it. So it was really, it was, it was like being in the Navy of trading. Like they really put pressure on me. And sadly, like I said, um, like when he passed away, um, I just referred back to retail trading and honed in those risk management strategies that they taught me into retail trading because for me personally, and that's just my opinion, but I personally think that trading is, well, we've all heard it, but it really is 80 or 90% even risk management. The rest is just strategy. Okay. So, the, so you're saying that risk management was a huge piece in your success. You're working with these individuals who seem to have a lot of credibility and they're passing on some of their key tips, but the key tips seem to be risk management. So what about risk management was so important and how has it affected your trading? Um, the one thing that they definitely taught me is to be very selfish with my profits. So uh, there's a fine line between giving your trades some room to breathe and then just being selfish with your profits, knowing when the trade is going to go against you and when to cut your winners, not only cutting your losses, because, bro, to be honest, between you and I, every, anybody can enter a trade. Um, the chart goes either up or down. It's when to exit where you make your money. So what they taught me is, to be extremely selfish with the trade. There's always going to be another opportunity is what they usually tell me. And what I also learned from a bunch of, like from Q and everybody else and you and what I've been seeing on the stories, there's always going to be another trade. So being selfish with your profits and not over trading. Over trading and not over leveraging. So, so many great points here. So many things we could touch on. Let's take a, let's take a little bit further back. Talk to us about your trading journey. A lot of people have a different arc. Some people say they succeeded in one year. Some people blew money for two, three years. Can you talk to people about your success arc? Were you one of the individuals that saw a lot of success early in the beginning, and then you had some troubled times and then came back to it? Can you talk to us about the uh, the journey? Oh, with pleasure, bro. So no, definitely. Uh, it was, it's, a, it's definitely been a tough journey. So um, out of matric, or basically I sat during matric and I still remember like yesterday, my friends, they laughed at me. They told me, no, you're never going to get this. And long story short, I'm not going to make it a sob story. But like we all know, there's a bunch of people doubting in their journey. So I borrowed funds from my dad, about roughly $1,000. I lost it <laughs> within like two hours. Um, I went back. I was obviously a varsity student first year in college. And I washed cars. I did like promotional work and stuff. Saved up for up until $300. And um, yeah, basically no risk management at all. I built it up until eight hundred dollars, and lost it, lost it again. So basically, it was all just a back and forth, back and forth. But like I said, um, after like I would love to say after my first year I got consistent, but like I said, after my third year it was only when I started seeing consistent and when I started seeing consistency, and that that started with my first hundred dollar day, then my first five hundred dollar day, and so it just it really 
gain momentum as soon as you started seeing consistency. And it, it's all about focusing on the basics first. So I think we have a, a similarity in the journeys because I also quit trading at one point and then I ended up getting dragged back. And I think the break provided some sort of clarity for me. What got you back into trading? And what did you learn in that transition period from taking a break from trading to getting back in that you feel like gave you an advantage? So it's a, it's a two part answer. So I was just, this is just the type of person that I am, bro. Um, if, if you ask my friends or my family, if somebody tells me I can't do something, it stirs a fire inside of me. Like, I saw, I saw you also in the fighting. Uh, like I'm also a boxer on the sideline and people always told me that like I got a major lower back injury and the doctors told me I'll be in a wheelchair for the rest of my life. I took that as a challenge and I got my first amateur fight, my second amateur fight, my third amateur fight. Um, I did wrestling. I did anything you can think about. So my main focus about life is if you tell me I can't do something, I will, I, I will do it twice if I can. So uh, just everybody telling me, yeah, I, I knew you would give up. I knew that you're going to quit. That just stirred a fire inside of me. And the second answer is, um, I just, I, I went back into my trading journey questioning everything. Like, I wanted to be real with myself, but I question everything. Like, if I see something, let's say, for example, I see on your Instagram, you you made a big trade. I, will, I won't look at the profits. I'll go and I will study your trade. And I will like ask myself, not is this real? I'm not concerned about that. I'm concerned about how, what is his thought process? How did he learn? Like I'm forever a student. I just, I just question every single method. That's awesome. So I think that's a, a very important thing that you just noted at the end, which is the folk. Some, a lot of people tend to get caught up in the money. And that's why mm -hmm. I feel like their journey takes longer because they're not actually looking at the rationale behind the decisions. So yeah, bro. that tool of looking at someone's trades, for example, I used to do the same with Q, you know, he would post the currency geek and I would look at the trade and I would say, everybody's texting me and calling me and they're like so much profits and they're focused on the money. But if you look at the trade idea, you'll, you'll really start to understand the decision making. So Definitely. how would you describe your decision making in your, your first few years of trading versus kind of how you would describe yourself today? That's a very good question, bro. That actually got me thinking. So I would say the first few years I was chasing money, just like you mentioned, you hit it right on the dot. I was chasing, uh, I, I wanted to buy a Lambo. I wanted to buy a McLaren. I mean, I was 21 years old. That's crazy. Oh, well, 19 years old. That's crazy. And how old are um, you so now? I just, I'm, I'm turning 24 next month. <laughs> yep. Okay. Yeah, bro. So, and now I think about now is I'm thinking long-term. Um, I'm focusing on long-term growth, leaving something for my son and his son. Um, and using trading as a door, as just a step into the right direction, using it as a tool for more business, more growth, and just more, more opportunities. Okay. So do you see trading as a mechanism for you to invest in other things or for you Definitely. to, you know, just to live off of trading? Well, at this moment, I've got a few other things on the sideline, but the main focus is definitely like, I would say 70% live off from trading and 30% other investments. But I have to, I have to be honest, me doing signals and stuff now, it really um, puts some, not pressure, but it puts, some, it challenge, it's challenging me to really every day stay on the charts. Like you have to constantly provide that value, show your students some love, show them some content, show them some chart breakdown. So it's really not trading off from your phone and living off from your phone. You're constantly learning. You're constantly analyzing. You're constantly just working on your craft. But I would definitely say, yes, I'm focusing on mainly making most of my growth off from trading. I don't know. This is a personal question. You, you can answer this I or not. But how, do you, how do you feel like your trading would be if, if you weren't giving back so much? And how do you feel like your trading is because you're giving back so much? The giving back in, with regards to? In regards to like just sending out signals, doing webinars, anything that takes away from you focusing on your own trading? Because we all experience this where we wanted to give back. And we want to start something because we're trying to give some value. And at some mm. point, it might impact our trading. So I always Definitely. think to myself, how would I be trading if I didn't have these obligations? And so do you, you know, do you have like a, an idea of what your trading would look like if you didn't have those obligations? De oh yeah, definitely. I would, I would be a lot more aggressive. I think, I don't know, I'm not hammered on the correct word, but I would be a lot more careless with regards to like typing out the correct signal, not making a spelling mistake. You understand what I'm saying? Stuff like that. And like, I just did, did a giveaway today. 
I gave away three funding challenge accounts. And you come to a sense of gratitude. Um, you, you start, like, I wish I received things like this when I started trading, bro. Um, so that just makes, that just takes me personally as a trader back and makes me appreciative of what I did and what I could have done if I was in, in this, these person's seats back in the day. Yeah. Yeah, the level of opportunity available today, guys, is crazy. The fact Definitely. that you gave away three funded accounts today, that's just insane. You know, for, for most of us, everybody who started trading probably four, five years ago plus, everyone had to, there was no funding challenges. So you really had to blow the account and then scale capital, take some of that capital, be responsible with it, do smart things with it. And learning that journey, I feel like is extremely important. I'm glad that a lot of people don't have to go through that journey, but I think there's parts of it that you, know, you can't replace through other types of education. You mentioned something Definitely. earlier. Actually, matter of fact, let's jump into something first and then we'll, I'll ask you these questions. Okay. Big, you've had a big trading month or I think it was last month. Do you want to describe the trading month that you had some of the big uh, results and are those results typical for you or was this something outsized? Definitely not. I was pushing myself. So I had a 200K day the month before that. I had a 250K day and then I had a 450K. It, it, people say it wasn't a day, but it wasn't. I have to be honest, it wasn't three days. It was a swing trade. And then I had a million dollar month, but I, I want to touch base on, and I don't think a lot of people talk about this, what happens after you have a big day or a big month, bro. And it's really, it's, it's not a nice feeling, bro, because you're constantly feeling pressure. Like if, like the other day I made seven, seven K on the day, I thought to myself, wow, is this it? And then I just took a step back and told myself, this is not you, bro. Um, you have to be grateful for everything that you get in the market. So I'm here expecting to make 250k, 100k, even 10k a day. And that, that is not like I'm I'm starting to see the money again. And I don't like that. So just to be real, <laughs> making big days is not all fun and games because you expect that of yourself each and every time. So it's not typical, bro. Definitely not typical results. And I I probably I probably won't push myself like that sometime anytime soon because it really takes an emotional strain on you because you expect those big numbers every single time. For yeah. sure. And at all levels, and I know a lot of folks might not be able to relate to making a million dollars in a month, but at all levels, I believe that controlling yourself on the upside is more important than controlling yourself on the downside. Humans Definitely. were very adaptable. And so if you lose a bunch, at some point, you'll take a step away, you'll reevaluate, and you'll be able to come back. When you start winning a lot, it tends to cloud your judgment. And you just, like you said, you tend to get too focused on an expectation that you set for yourself. But you and I both know that trading is more of like a you, I mean, I don't know if you guys have baseball down in South Africa, but we have baseball. <laughs> so you do base hits, base hits, base hits, and the occasional home run like you've had this previous summer, right? So can mm. you talk to people about a big trade? Because there's different components that are tough. Analyzing one, executing one, managing one, and then what you just described, which is what happens after. Can you talk to us about your process during that whole trade? Yeah, so, so first things first is I didn't expect that trade to be so big. Um, but whenever I find a big trade and a bunch of people are going to argue with me, but I like to have it back to by a fundamental idea. For example, my Euro USD trade, it was, a, I think, 447K that I closed on. It was backed by fundamental events, um, the USD interest rates. And for example, my gold trade before that was also interest rates. So I like to have it. Uh, my idea was having it as a scalp trade. But as soon as I saw fundamental backing it, I, I, I left it in because as a trader, I'm, I'm not comfortable. And I hope this answers your question. I'm not comfortable with getting in and out each and every time. So if it continues get, giving me money and it continues paying itself, I'm going to leave it in. So I'm a very firm believer with leaving runners. So that is with regards to my entries. I always leave runners. Analyzing it, I continued continuously watch the fundamental movements and the overview stuff like that is structure still in place is a technical analysis still in place and managing it is definitely the most difficult part as soon as it hit 300k or 400k i told myself all right let's let's call it quits but you 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 get a sense of pushing yourself a little bit more a little bit more a little bit more until i told myself all right i'm starting to see these numbers and i'm starting to be become ungrateful Let's close it out. Structure is broken. So I constantly just try and be real with myself. 
So is that your limit when to get out of a trade? It's as soon as you start to focus too much on the money and you're focusing too much on, I guess, the profits, then that's when you decide to, to call it a quits or what? Yeah, definitely. When it's backed by technical analysis, like structure is broken and I see the, the change in trend. But in this journey, like I see my trading as a journey. I'm planning on trading 30 years down the line, 40 years down the line. In this phase in my journey, I'm focused a lot on my emotional management. So definitely that would be a number one that you just mentioned. Okay, we'll get back to the importance of emotional management and preparing yourself for long-term trading which is a conversation that I feel like we don't have enough. A lot of people want to trade for now because they're desperate to get out of a certain financial situation. But thinking about this in a long-term perspective, that's where all the real opportunities are. And preparing yourself today can obviously you know, give you an advantage in the future. Now, when you're, taking a, when you're inside the swing trade, you mentioned that management is the most difficult part. First off, why? Because I constantly wanted to close. I, like when I saw 200K, I thought, all right, I can... And this is me being totally 100% transparent with you. I thought myself, all right, I can now I can afford a Ferrari. And when I saw 300, all right, I can now afford that house. When I saw 400, I'm like, all right, I can now afford that house and a Ferrari. And I'm like, bro, you're 24 years old. Just take a step back and be grateful for what you got. So I refund, I, I withdraw those funds and I gave more or less off of it away because for me personally, I don't want to see money as an object or I, I want to appreciate it. I want to work for it. it. It doesn't matter if it's trading, I, if it's anything, I, I want to appreciate it and I want to feel like I deserve it. Have you always had a detachment to money as an object or is that something that came over time through your maturity in trading? No, that's definitely something that came over time, not just as in trading, it's just in the daily life. Um, that's that's part of the reason why I wear the mask is because I've seen what what money does to people, bro. And I haven't seen a beautiful picture, to be honest with you. So yeah. I just try and steer clear from that. So is that why you, okay, that's, that's fair. So yeah. <laughs> um, you said that, uh, we're going to go back to some of the questions I had earlier. You said that ego was a huge part of why you weren't successful at, in the beginning of your trading journey. For a lot of people mm -hmm. that watch the show, they're probably in that phase of their journey where maybe they don't want to admit some things to themselves or they're avoiding some key, uh, some key actions they have to take. What role did ego play in your journey in the beginning and how did you overcome that? So I'm, I'm very, I have a very serious case of um, OCD. Mm -hmm. So I was searching for that 100% win rate. I was searching for that golden strategy and my ego, when I lost the trade, I was like, no, this, this is not going to happen. I'm not going to lose a trade. So I stacked more. I inserted more funds, I deposited more funds into the account. Um, my, I didn't want to get that bump on my ego by taking a small loss and then just waiting for another opportunity. I would rather blow the account, not take that bump on my ego by taking a small loss or even a loss. I would then just at the end of the day, I would just blow the account. So I don't want to take that bump on the ego by taking a loss. I felt like, no, I'm, I'm not going to take a loss. I'm not, I'm not a loser. So how were you able to overcome the ego? Like, did you just start to convince yourself that, or I'll let you answer the question. Yeah, so, so that was just basically a, a long afternoon conversation with my dad. And he's a very big businessman. So he just told me, he just reminded me that it's business cost. It's um, water and electricity bills. It is taxes that you have to pay taxes, part of the game. Um, it is just, it's part of the game. It's going to happen. So that just, and, and it's something I'm working on to this day, um, working on my losses. I have to be honest, it's not something I perfected yet, but it, I just remind myself of those big days that I did have and the big profits that I did have. And that makes me feel better in a sense. <laughs> so how do you gauge a successful trading day from a not successful trading day or successful trading week or month? Is um, it just by generating profits? Is it by, you know, sticking to a certain thing? How do you gauge your own success? So my own success, I would only see a losing week if I didn't follow my plan. Like, let's say I take seven losses this, this week. And I, I don't make any any win. I would still see it as a win week because I followed my plan. So I, I would only see it as a losing week if I didn't follow my plan and I broke my rules. That that's that's me personally. That's what works for me. I don't look at the numbers because the overall pip amount, if you keep a positive RR, in my opinion, you will get out on top at the end of the month or at the end of the day. So following your rules, that's a priority above just looking at the overall PNL. Right. Definitely. Definitely. Perfect. Perfect stuff. 
uh, you said it's it's easy for anyone to get into a trade. It's easy for people to get into a great entry as well. But getting out of a trade is something that a lot of folks struggle with. Do you have a certain tactic that you use for exits? Do you predetermine an exit before you enter a trade? Or do you believe in entering a trade and figuring it out as you go? No, I definitely, I plan my exit out before I enter the trade. It's like, and I'm very hectic on metaphors, but like you said, you're moving soon. How, how do you know you're going to move if you don't know where to move to? That's just for me personally. Like you, you, you won't know where to go if you don't know like where's your destination. So for me personally, I'm not going to enter a trade and then just letting it go because that, that that's for me personally, that's gambling. Uh, like the, the aim is to leave it running but running until a certain extent, there has to be a point where you tell yourself, all right, let's break, let's put stop us a break even, or let's secure some profits. Let's just put ourselves on a good foot in the market. So that's basically it. I always have an exit strategy. Uh, you also mentioned that you use fundamentals with your trading, and that's one of the key drivers to let you know when to exit. So if there was a priority, like let's say that you don't get a fundamental driver that's going to confirm or deny the trade that you have. Do you look at technicals more importantly? Do you look at fundamentals more importantly? Which one takes the priority? And that's a good question, bro. I would, I would say, I would say fundamentals, but I try, like, I wouldn't look at selling gold at first, looking at fundamentals. I look at the technicals first and then back it with fundamentals. But I'll definitely say fundamentals contradict. I know this sounds contradictory, but I would definitely say the fundamentals have more weight to my reasoning behind the trade. But let's say there's no fundamentals and I still see the technical lining up, I'll still take the trade. Beautiful, beautiful answer. How Definitely would you describe yourself as a trader? Anonymous. <laughs> <laughs> Forget that part. Uh, I mean, in terms of, you know, like, like, let's say that your trader's profile, are you a swing trader, intraday trader, scalper, and then your risk profile? Mm. Are you kind of like a, a very conservatively risk person? Are you an aggressive person? How would you describe your trading style? I would, I would say intraday and medium, medium risk. I love to live by the, the three accounts rule. Like I always have three accounts. Like one account is to put food on the table for your family. That's your safe account. That's where you can tell your family, don't worry about a thing. I got you. The second account is for you. If you want to buy like, I don't know what people are into these days, shoes, PlayStation, stuff like that, smart TV. That, that is for you. The third account is for houses, investments, big stuff, big payments like that. That is low, low, low risk. So that's just how I see it. So would you recommend people try to push with small capital and try to grow small capital to the point where they can diversify the profits into multiple accounts? Or do you recommend that folks build their skill set and fund multiple accounts? I know this is not financial advice. Everybody, please do your own research. Yeah. But just from your, um, your prerogative, what do you think? It depends on their journey, um, their, their level of skill set. But I would definitely say option number two, um, rather have it, build it up and then fund multiple accounts. Or if you can, more, b even better, get a funded account. But like I always, like I tell my students, trade for six months on a demo account on a 0 0.01 lot. If you can build that account up, you're basically ready for anything. So, and this sounds so cliche, but definitely, if you have the skill, bro, you can you can trade with any amount of capital. You can reach any goal. Now, I'm not saying you're going to make a million dollars out of $10. I don't even want to jump on that subject. <laughs> That's a whole nother topic for another day. But if, if you really have the skill, focus on getting consistent first. So to the viewers watching, what I did for six months is I traded 0 0.01 on a demo account for six consecutive months. And I started gaining consistency on that. And what were you doing when you're trading the small account? Because some people, when they hear that, they're like, okay, am I, is my job to try to make as much money while using small lots? Is my job to learn a strategy? What would you recommend people use that exercise for? I would definitely say focus on your risk management and your um, RR, your, your risk to reward ratio. So take a step back and lower your expectations. You're not going to make $10,000 out of $500. Um, I know a lot of people make it, but if you're starting out, just focus on consistency first. So when, you, when you're trading on a small account, start. The, the main aim for you with trading lower, well, a lower lot size is to get that consistency first. Focus on getting those runners and getting trading each and every day if there is a setup. And then just focusing on rewarding yourself with a good RR at the end of the day. 
Beautiful. So more of a focus on the actual strategy, on the mechanics of trading rather than trying to pull profits. Definitely. Um, I always say this, bro. It's like, it's like, I don't know how much you know about the mechanics of a car, but the strategy alone is just the, the, the outside of the car. Now you have to add seats. You have to add a steering wheel, a steering wheel. You have to add um, tires. You have to add an engine. All those things are risk management, psychology, exit criteria, motions. All those things for the for your trading car to drive. <laughs> Me again with metaphors, but it really it all adds together. If one aspect fa fails or lacks in your trading journey, you have to take your trading serious. Um, so all of those things have to add together. When you say take trading serious, what does that mean to you? Um, journal down, not just trade off from your phone while you're in the car with friends eating lunch out. Take it serious. Focus on. Um, like I always say this consistency, write down how you're feeling. Um, take it serious as a real job. This is a real business. Um, that's a good question. That got me thinking, bro. <laughs> but the main thing is journal down, take, take notes, um, record your process, even record yourself while talking, but just focus and taking it serious, trying to be better every single day. So you're, you're in these trades that are what I would consider um, large capital. And you're seeing opportunities float, float by. And these are big opportunities. So at 100K, you could buy this thing. At 200K, now you're in a different class. At 300K, now you can do both options. At 400K, and so you're presented with all of these different opportunities. What framework do you have now for managing big capital or managing these sorts of trades? I know that you, you said that you're like not chasing these big trades and they sometimes happen. But are there certain things that you do in your routine to keep yourself grounded? Yeah, I, I, build, I build up small accounts, bro. I build up small accounts, $500 accounts, 0 0.01 lot size. I build it up just to challenge myself and remind myself of, quote, unquote, who I am and what, what type of trader I want to be. And this is something you still do today? Still do today. And I think I won't ever stop. I build up small accounts. That's absolutely incredible. Yeah. Where do you see your trading going? You said that you want to trade in the long term for 10, 20, 30 years. A lot of people don't think about their trading that far in advance, maybe because they don't have a long enough understanding of where trading can take them. Where do you see yourself in the future? And where do you think trading plays a part? I definitely want to see myself helping people, number one. I don't know how. I don't know where. I don't know when. I definitely see myself helping people. And um taking a more generational approach, teaching my son, teaching his son how to trade and then just getting out there and showing the, the real transparent way of trading, um, doing, doing podcasts, um, just, just getting the word out there, bro. I think that's just, that's just the main thing, just getting the word out there and helping people reach their certain expectations in the world of trading. I don't want to go that route of opening a brokerage and stuff like that. Um, because then I feel like, and I don't want to step on anybody's toes here, but then I feel like you are focusing more on one aspect rather than the other aspect of trading. Now, at a certain business point perspective, if you make more capital, becoming a broker, that's all on you. But for me personally, I don't want to go that route. That's fair enough. Yeah. There's a lot of there's a lot of like key topics that people disagree on in trading, and some that are pretty <laughs> consistent. So I kind of wanted to get your take on some of the controversial ones. And I'm not going to put you under fire here. Don't worry. It's going to be like, no, a, no worries. like mildly, mildly uh, controversial. And because everyone has, a, has their own preference. So let's take yeah. risk, for example. What do you think about risk? I think, I think risk is not too, too, too much focused on, on the world of trading at this current stage. Um, I think not a lot of people focus on trading. I definitely think it's subjective. Um, I mean, go and test it out for yourself, put a bunch of people around the table and just throw the word risk on there. And people would say, people would talk about win rate. Yo, man, I haven't lost a trade in 13 weeks, stuff like that. People would talk about all those things. But for me personally, I definitely think that, and people always say, focus on your risk management, focus on your risk management. And that irritated me when I started trading because I didn't know what they were saying. I don't know what, what they meant. Yeah, I'm focusing on risk management, but what do you mean when you say focus on risk management? And that is, like I said in the beginning, that's what these guys help me with, uh, being stingy, uh, being selfish with your with your profits, stuff like that. So I definitely think risk management is subject. You have, okay, I have to kind of take a detour here. You have a unique experience talking with folks who have institutional experience and then taking that to the retail space. What do you think are the biggest differences between a retail trader and an institutional trader? Definitely they're trading with a lot more capital. Um, but with regards to the personal aspect is, and this is what we've been talking about the entire meeting is they focus a lot more on risk management and it, it pains me to say this, but 
even in in the few groups that I'm in, I see people focusing too much on strategy. Um, and they're focusing too much on what the technical analysis is saying. Now, don't get me wrong, technical analysis is extremely important. But the first thing you'll talk about when you talk about when you talk with a person working for a bank or something is they'll ask you how much did you risk. That's the first thing. So you, you would say that retail focuses a lot more on the upside on making money and professionals think a lot more about managing risk. Definitely, because they, they got a bunch of people. And I think I think it's it's not a wrong or correct um perspective on both sides because uh, the institutional people they have a bunch of eyes looking at them and I mean if you don't make your quota for the day you're being kicked out you're jobless um for a retail trader you're you're on your own so you can basically do what you want awesome quote unquote do what you want yeah I mean that's the danger right it's a double edged sword double edged sword <laughs> exactly. So psychology, a lot of people say that you should learn psychology before you start trading. So you have an understanding. I tend to think that it doesn't make a lot of sense for people. What we, what we mean when we say psychology, when they don't have any context or experience, not to lead the question a certain way, but what do you think about psychology and should traders have some context before they learn about psychology? Or is that something that folks should know before they step into the arena? For me personally, I don't think it's possible to, to get it to know it before stepping in the arena because that, that comes with experience. Um, you won't know how to manage a trade if you haven't opened a trade yourself yet. It's just like being a meme with a metaphor again. Sorry, bro, but being in a race car, you won't you won't be able to <laughs> you won't be able to say how it is or how to drive a race car if you haven't been in one yourself. So psychology, it just comes with experience, unfortunately and fortunately. So just as you gain experience, your psychology, you're going to become more adaptive and you're going to become more experienced in the psychology field of training. That's awesome. Talk to me about education. A lot of people are conflicted because there's so many resources out today, but they don't know, they don't really have a framework on how to choose which education they should follow. What's your take on education and what has helped you in your journey? Definitely, like I mentioned before, I question everything. Um, I question everything. Like if I see person A is trading order blocks, I'd, I, for example, I'm not going in and saying, no, order blocks, it doesn't work. And I'm not going in and seeing whether it works. I'm going in and checking why it works. Why does it make sense? Like what is behind that currency pair for it to be be um, reacting or from an order block. If I see a person trading trend lines, let's take trend lines for example. Why are why is that trend line not being respected? Why is it being respected? Not how is it being respected? You are three touch bounce. No, I'm asking myself why. That that would be my advice. The tricky thing with the why questions is sometimes it's hard to find the rationale behind why something happened in the markets. Do you sometimes find that you don't find an answer? Or do you feel like you always find an answer when you ask why? No, I don't always find an answer, but but time time is a great professor. It reveals the answers as time goes on. So, for example, like I didn't know these SMC concepts that people were talking about all of a sudden and not stepping on anybody's toes. But as a matter of fact, it just revealed itself that it's just supply and demand in, certain, in most situations. And that then I just studied supply and demand and I gained more sense about the whole concept. Oh, awesome stuff. Talk to me about journaling. So so journaling, I love journaling. Um, I used to hate it in the beginning, but then I just made it fun for myself. I got a notebook, which is over here. I got a notebook. Well, I got a bunch of notebooks, actually. So these are just a few. Excuse me. And I like to write down everything, bro. I like to write down, like, today, how did I feel? How did I wake up? Am I ready to take a trade? Um, why did I feel Euro is the was a short at that time. And then I write down a trade specific. So it's basically like a diary for a trader. I like to write down everything, how I feel, because then three years down the line, I can go back to my book and I can say, all right, I entered a short on 21st August and I saw the market drop, but I entered a buy. How did I feel at that certain stage? And then I can learn off from that. That helps me with the psychology factor. When I enter the, when I write down, I, I like to write stuff down. When I write down the the the, the credentials of the trade, I'm gonna look. All right, my stop loss was too wide, or my stop loss was too it was too close. Stuff like that. Then I can focus on my risk management. Most of us, I feel like, struggle to journal in the beginning because it's annoying. Like it's like one of those things that you just want you want to try and avoid at first until you realize it's necessary. Was there something mm -hmm. that convinced you to start journaling, and what? You know, what advice could you give to folks at home that are right now like, I really don't want to journal. I think it's a waste <laughs> of time or it's just annoying or whatever it is. What advice could you give to folks? 
Yeah, so journaling sucks, guys. It definitely in the beginning it sucks, but like I say, make it fun for yourself. And what's what helped me to start journaling is I looked at it as a business perspective. Like McDonald's, for example, is just use McDonald's. Everyone knows McDonald's. McDonald's won't improve if they don't have something to reflect on the previous month, if they don't have the numbers, the net income that they had for the previous month. Just the exact, the exact same with you. You won't improve on your psychological factors if you don't have number, numbers, quote unquote, to reflect back on. That That is what helped me. And just start. Just start and see how you feel about it. At the end of the day, you, you'll know whether it's for you or whether it's not for you. But nine times out of 10, you, you, you'll reap the benefits. The hardest thing to tell someone is trading might not be for them. And I know that we're very persistent people. And so myself, I could never imagine myself fully quitting because I feel like I'll always try and figure this out. For your perspective, what do you, when do you feel like someone should admit to themselves that trading is not for them versus when is like someone down on their luck and they, you know, they have the qualities for trading and they should keep going? That, that's, that's a very good question, bro. I personally think trading is for everyone. If you have access to internet and you have a mobile device, the best answer I can give to that tricky question of yours, bro, good question. But the best answer I can give, if you're in a ton of debt, you have dependents like a son or a daughter. That is not only reason for you to later come back to trading. What I'm saying is get a job, get a steady source of income first while you're le learning to trade because you've got mouths to feed, bro. You've got people depending on you. Trading with a $10 account ain't going to cut it for you at this moment. So just be real with yourself. And I'm not being nasty. I'm just, the, I was in that situation. So just take a step back, get a steady source of income. Sit until two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, study trading while your family is asleep. But when it's a.m. time, you go back to your job and you just you just gain ground again for a few months and then you can get, start trading again. That's awesome. Are there any yeah. things that you still see in your trading that you can improve on? And if so, what do you think those are? This is, this is a double-edged sword, but I, I definitely feel I can trade a little bit more in my current phase of my journey. But now, like I said, I'm just enjoying life. I'm just enjoying the. I'm just um enjoying the the rewards that I've been receiving from my hard work of three years ago. So I can definitely trade a little bit more, but not over trading. So I see a lot of opportunities, and I'm like, damn, I could have took, I could have taken that trade. But it, it's all part of the process. As soon as I'm in front of the computer and I see a trade, um, I'll definitely take that one. But now I'm focused on trading to live and not living to trade awesome stuff what does enjoying the money mean to you so you had big days huge withdrawals uh you said you gave half of it away but you know what are some things that you're doing that you weren't doing before that you're, you kind of to reward yourself so <laughs> i have a big love for animals bro a uh, big big love ever since i was a child so for me a sense of enjoyment is donating food to charities for animals and for me i love cars and i'm gonna it's going to sound nasty but just buying a new car building it up and then selling it again stuff like that i, I love enjoying that and being able to go and buy buy that certain parts because remember this is coming from a guy who's bank card declined in front of his girlfriend for ice cream so <laughs> definitely being able to like purchase a new clutch for your car or just purchase a just purchase something for, for someone and just helping someone, it, it, that's something that I enjoy a lot. Um, dirt bikes, cars, just enjoying it and being able to do so. That's that's incredible. So how would you describe success? I don't know yet, bro. I'm not successful yet in my opinion. <laughs> but the best thing I would say, success comes with contentment. Being content in your field, I think. I think being content with what you're doing. And being able to give back is how I would describe success. Being able to be in that position where you can tell yourself, all right, I'm in that steady ground, no debt, no stress, stress-free, and family and friends are healthy and happy. That's incredible. So three yeah. tips to traders that you feel like helped you in your trading journey that after this call, folks can go start working on and focusing on and uh, you feel like you can give back to the folks. All right. So without saying going journal, going focus on your risk management, stuff like that, I would definitely say um, question. start questioning everything. It's definitely number one. Number two, uh, 
Um, don't believe everything you see online. <laughs> that goes hand in hand with number one. And number three, if you're in a trade, let that trade run. Excellent advice. All right, Charles, we're going to have you back on to talk a little bit more about trading, to go in depth on some of the trades that you took. But I appreciate you stopping by and sharing some of the wisdom from the last few years and uh, letting us learn from some of your success. Thank you, bro. I've, I've been dreaming of, of a podcast with you ever since I started trading. So it was really a, it was really an honor to be on. And thank you for the viewers for having me. I really appreciate it, bro. My man. Great to have you on.